Very excited. All these new changes is going to be a fun. It's going to be a fun training today. Absolutely incredible day out. Let's let's get going. All right. So welcome everybody. Uh, this is again a very similar format, but I'll just go over it. Just uh, if there's anybody new um, on. Basically, how our trainings are set up. Um, we go through. We're going to do some questions that you've already submitted. And I'm going to go through those and answer those to the best of my knowledge. And then if you, if I miss something or you have any additional Q&As, make sure that you ask them at the end. And I'll go ahead and read them and answer them from there. Um, all recordings will be posted in the portal like usual. So if you want to rewatch some of these, it's probably a good idea that you do that. Um, it's just like reading a book. You know, you can only take so much in when you go through it the first time. But repetition, repetition builds that that mental muscle. So it's really important that you just schedule it and go through it, and uh, you know you'll you'll it'll sink in in no time. So we got a couple announcements. Make sure too, guys, that you have if you have a piece of paper and you can write things down. It's really important to stay focused on these. And uh, if you actually write things down, then they're more apt to stick as well. So that's important. It's a important part of the nervous system linking that stuff up. So App Empire Live Event 2013. This is the one that we did last year. Um, if anyone's on here, definitely say hello. But uh, we had an amazing time. So this year, we're doing it November 16th. And it's in San Francisco. Beautiful shot of the, of the bridge there. Um, really excited for this one. It's going to be a blast. And the weather here is perfect now. So it's not going to be the windy, cold, rainy San Francisco that some people are used to. Uh, if you have any questions about the live event, uh, make sure you send an email to support, support at appempire.com. All right, cool. So first, let's go over the newsletter topics and then some questions that um, some people submitted before. Updates. How many people have gotten the new iOS 7? I'm curious. This year, it's been amazing, the actual adoption rate. People are adopting to the new iOS more than I've ever seen before. I don't have the current numbers, but I saw a report. It was like 30% in the beginning adoption rate, which is pretty, pretty incredible. So I personally, I love it. There's a lot of people that are saying that, you know, um, it looks like crap or, you know, they don't like some of the functionalities, but I think Apple did actually really well with this. Uh, I'm excited. I don't have the new phone yet, but I'm getting it uh, any day now. So um, here's a question that people are asking that, that I think is really important especially with all the new changes. How much do you usually spend on updates? So this one is it's kind of changing, right? We have we kind of have our, you know, our, our fundamentals, like our foundational knowledge with this business, and then we have things that change, right? Because the business changes or there's new software, there's new techniques. So updates is one of these. Uh, it hasn't changed dramatically. The, the same thing kind of applies where you should be constantly looking at your apps, update it to make sure that your marketing materials are working and using these updates to really, you know, tweak your marketing materials. So before a lot of people were just doing updates because you could immediately get all these people to see your app. It would, it would pop up on your phone. You could see, okay, uh, you know, emoji. Great. He's doing something else. And then you would see, okay, this app, um, it, there's something new about it and it would get the user to actually go inside the app and, and play with it. So you'd get ad revenue, you'd get a, a better percentage to actually close people in at purchases. So it was a, it was a, it was a great little technique and it still is one of the biggest, I think, uh, you know, lessons that I learned early on with this. And, and, and one thing that I still see people m missing, we just did a blog post about it is that use your updates for also tweaking your marketing materials, especially your free ones. So this means your, you know, your title, your keywords, you know, if you can, if you can change and maybe do a, a similar icon and maybe it's a little bit different with a color or maybe your screenshots, or maybe some of your copy, uh, that's important to do, right? So you have your inside of your app and out and, and outside of your app. And if you can use these updates to change these. So how often should you do it? It depends on your app, you know, a couple of times a month for sure. Um, but it really depends on your strategy. If it's a it's a short term little tweak, or if it's a big you know big tweak that you're updating, you know maybe you're getting a lot of feedback from your customers, and they want a big uh, they want a big update. So in those, you know, it might take you a month or two 
to actually give them what they want. But I think it's important that you still tweak your marketing materials and try new things. And you can always put in there too, you know, hey, big update coming to let them know. When working with a new developer slash project, how many updates should I ask for and at what price? So updates meaning, uh, I'm assuming this question is uh, them actually loading it into the store. So you can do updates where you're not really adding anything, right? We just put bug fixes, but it's really just taking your app and um, you know doing a brand new, you're, you're basically rebundling it and putting it in as a new ID. And uh, it's just an update. So that's tweaking your marketing materials. And if they're doing this for you, then maybe you say, hey, I'm looking for you to do this once you upload it once to the store, you know, maybe three times or four times. This is really up to the situation, though. I don't think there's a golden rule for this because sometimes dealing with, you know, your programmer um, can be arduous. So, you know, this is where you can either decide that you want to do it yourself and just, you know, do an update or you can let them know, hey, yes, it's been great working with you. Can we make sure we do this? you know, three times, and then you can let them know when you want to do it um, based on the data that you're getting. If you don't have data and you don't know what's going on with your app as far as, you know, let's try to change some of the marketing materials, then it doesn't make sense to really update it. You know, we have to make sure that we're, we're smart when we're updating these apps. Do you think instant background updates with iOS 7 hurts or helps developers? Um, so yeah, this is a big change guys. This is a big one that I see. Um, and I'm not sure the exact effect we're going to have to wait to see. Um, I do think it actually hurts developers, uh, more than it helps. And we'll see what happens there. It helps in a way where, you know, it allows you to get your apps updated. I think it helps the consumer more than it helps the developers. Um, but again, it's, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. So, you know, consumers now can just grab their phone if they're on Wi-Fi, it updates in the background automatically. And it's great because if you're trying some new things out or you have a bug that you actually fixed, then automatically it immediately allows them to, um, to, to, to update it. So they just open the app and then they see it. The problem with this is that, you know, now they don't have this signal to get them to see what's going on with the app. So this is where I recommend, you know, push notifications and stuff like that where you actually get your hand to wave up and say okay i've changed this you know and you, you kind of tackle the push notification with your updates you get them to show value that's really important here so we'll see what happens on this but i think as long as you do a push notification um, i i think it will actually do probably a little bit better because most people were just doing updates without doing a push notification so the strategy changes a little bit does that make sense <laughs> yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. Another question. I'm trying to get more user feedback for updates. What's the best method to incentivize users? Social media isn't working that great for me. Yeah. So social media, I feel like I know a couple companies that have been able to make it successful, but most are not. So the 80, 20, right? We're always trying to see what is that? What is the actual one or two things that we can do to make things work? Um, you know, there's a couple of strategies that, that we like to use. So one is making sure that you give them a little pop-up screen or a little nag screen, uh, in the app. So instead of doing a push to maybe another app, when they open it, it can say, Hey, you like, you know, X, Y, Z app. Great. Please leave us feedback. And what, pe what people have done is when it says, you know, not right now, it basically says, you know, it goes off. So there's no negative reviews there. It just clicks off of the thing. Or if it says, yes, I want to leave positive feedback, then typically that user is going to leave a positive feedback. And it goes right to your, um, right to the review where you can write the review and then they can populate it into your, um, you know, into your app. So that's probably the best strategy that you can use. Sometimes you can incentivize by saying, you know, we're doing a lot of great things in this app. Um, your, your reviews help us spend more time in it, especially if it's a LTV, like a, you know, you have a, a long, uh, a long-term view on your app and there's, there's value there. That customer is going to want to participate into making sure that that app actually, um, you know, is going to stay around. So 
that's one of the easiest and best ways that you can do it. You can do this with Chart Boost as well and other of these ad networks to actually get people to be nagged into reviewing. When do you recommend not updating often and instead doing large releases? Very good question here. Um, so basically on this one, I don't, I'm not a big one on um, just doing large releases because you have to do updates for your marketing materials. I don't care, you know, who the person is or what company, whether it's a big, like a Zynga um, or Big Fish, or if it's just an indie developer, you know, we're, we're constantly tweaking our marketing materials. You know, there's, there's, there's constantly a new standard that we're having to rise up to. Um, there's constantly new trends that we can use. You know, our demographics changing a little bit. So we have to adapt that philosophy where it's okay to update, to change our marketing materials. And then strategically lay out the big releases, right? When we do the big ones, they have to actually mean something. And that's when we use the push, notifica uh, push notifications. So you might be you know, opening up a share feature of your app where, where they're incentivized to share it to their friends and they get something, you know, maybe they get more gold coins. Gold coins is a great, um, you know, incentivized way to, 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 to monetize it. So, Hey, get 500 gold coins. If you send it to five Facebook friends right now, um, stuff like that is good or posts on Facebook. Uh, and, and, and you can say, Hey, I'm, you know, we're changing, if it's not a share, maybe it's a mechanic, you know, if it's a fighting game or maybe it's a photo app and you added some new features, you know, or emoji, you added a whole new layer of, um, uh, of content, you know, depending on what your app is strategically put those releases in. And also guys, economically, you don't want to spend a lot of money on new releases where you're, you know, getting a developer to, to spend more time in it or you're creating more content. If you don't see the path to making money on this easy, meaning if it doesn't show you this app is making money and there's not an easy way where you're like, okay, I can just tweak this and get more, uh, more traffic or tweak this and monetize the traffic, then I wouldn't continue to spend a lot of money. And I see this problem a lot. People think it's the product. They think, okay, I'm just going to give them more content or I'm going to make this camera, man, this is going to be the best camera filter anyone's ever seen and the thing is this you know it's not about the product like any business you know and, and it's not building the product and they will come it's quite the opposite it's giving them the marketing and and making sure that you have a strong product behind that marketing um that that is you know one of the, the biggest things there's a um there's a youtube video i can't believe i'm mentioning this but i have to because i think it's brilliant it's actually it's called poopery and it's a hilarious viral video that came out and they had an incredible product, but they made this marketing video where they jumped on the virality of these other viral videos on YouTube. And immediately their video is controversial. It's in your face. It, it just is, is really, um, you know, smooth in an unsmooth way. And anyone that's seen it will, will probably understand what I'm saying there. But um, it, it, it's just that it's giving this marketing where it stands out, it closes the traffic, and then it gets them to actually get to your amazing product. Um, so just make sure that you, you strategically put those releases um, with that in mind. All right, ad networks. A lot of questions on ad networks. This is a, this is a big one. I'm looking for ad networks for my free app, one that does full page ads that fit full screen as well as banners and can target my buyers. Who do you suggest I work with? Okay, so these are the main ones I'll give you now, and it really depends again on your app, right? Whatever EPCM. So this is something we wanna keep on measuring with our apps, this is important. We don't wanna just pick one network and then say, okay, that's it and forget about it. Um, every week I like to go over these and have a spreadsheet where I can look at and say, okay, this app, is doing great on this ad network and then you know maybe another app is doing well on another ad network and you can switch these out you know I wouldn't spend a lot of time switch switching these out but in the beginning um, and, and maybe after a few months you test them out so one is RevMob I think you guys have heard of RevMob um, a full screen one app Lovin is is really good but they they have certain requirements on people you have to have a certain number of downloads um, coming through, but theirs are really good because they just have animations on theirs. 
I think a lot of these ad networks will probably be uh, adapting, you know, animations and probably even sounds and like call to actions pretty soon. So as a user, you'll be opening up, uh, you know, opening up an app and it'll say, you know, hey, check this out now. And it'll be a, you know, a, a beautiful cartoonish character, woman or something, or it'll be, you know, some some zany character that will be pushing you to click through to the next page. I think that's coming in the future, but right now there's, you know, App Lovin', there's RevMob, you have Chart Boost. Uh, they play around with full screen and not full screen. Uh, and you really want to just go through those. Those are some of the biggest ones. Um, there'll be a lot of, uh, of new ones that are coming up, but just make sure that you test these guys. Make sure you do maybe a two week or a monthly test. And remember that Saturday and Sundays and holidays, you're going to get a lot more traffic than during the rest of the week. So make sure that you're not making decisions, you know, based on certain days, but you're you're looking at a target of two weeks or a month to make sure that you're actually judging that. Does that make sense? All right. Beautiful. Everyone following along all right? Let's keep moving. Copyright. I have short animations in my app. Should I copyright these? Uh, I would say, you know, before you start getting trademarks and copywriting and all that fun stuff, that costs money. Uh, so before you do that, make sure that you're getting enough downloads and you're making enough money from it, or it doesn't really make sense. If you're a startup or you have a lot of money that you're investing in your app and it represents, you know, a brand or, or a big move on your part, then that's a different strategy than most of our customers, most of our clients that, you know, we're using, we're using this indie developer type of model. We're just trying to spend as little amount as possible to make as much as possible. So as little input for the most amount of output. Um, so that's a different strategy on that. And I would say once you start making a lot of money or if your app hits, um, which I guess is the same, then at that point you go into protecting yourself. But I don't think you really have anything until you start actually getting, you know, traffic or, you know, your revenue or if it's some really incredible, innovative idea, maybe that goes into the price of your app. You just say, OK, well, this is innovative. This is brand new. You know, and, and I hope you're doing this after you've also succeeded in something in apps to make sure that, you know, you're going to guarantee or at least give yourself the best chance for success. At that point, you can say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna copyright this or, or protect it. All right, when is it okay to use celebrities in your app? I see many do this, but I'm confused on how they do it. This one is also changing. Uh, a lot of people were trying celebrities and doing different names. Apple was, I would say they weren't the most consistent. They were slapping the hands of most and then they would let probably five to 10% go within there uh, if it hits. So this broke out, I would say about eight months ago, maybe 10 months ago, you saw some of these icons. So the, the word apps really showed it. And what they did was they did renderings of celebrities. So they didn't have an actual picture. They didn't have, you know, they weren't using that celebrity and saying, hey, this is, you know, advertised by this celebrity or, you know, nothing that was too controversial. Um, but yeah, they were, they were basically using this, uh, picture of the celebrity and they weren't putting the name you'd have to put in the actual name. And so there's not one rule on how to exactly do this, but usually the way I recommend is you can see the store, go on the store and see what people are actually using, you know, so go on the store, type in celebrities, see what apps come up, look at those apps and uh and, and start to see what apple is actually approving because that's the system that you want to follow you don't really want to go outside of that too much because you spend too much time creating this app um and, and maybe you have some type of mechanic so for instance the word apps the four picks one word are the ones that i'm talking about guys um maybe you have that one already set up or one that's like that and maybe another skin or theme is using celebrities in there then you're not your sole purpose of your app and your business isn't on this celebrity because I feel like that's somewhat of a gamble. Sometimes it works, but other times, you know, you can get slapped on the wrist. Um, so, yeah, make sure you keep looking at that when you see these trends, you see what Apple's approving um, and look at some of these apps are, are, are old school. They're, they're you know, from a couple of years ago. So make sure you look at 
a nap that was recently when I say recently, I say within the next last few months, and you can see what Apple's actually approved. Then you're like, okay, this is data that's reliable. Downloads and traffic. God, I get stressed when I see that. I'm not a big fan of traffic at all. All right, besides the, the right traffic, right? App traffic is great, but not that kind of traffic. All right, so what are your thoughts on launching an app as a paid app? And then in five days, releasing the app as free to get app reviewer sites to feature your app on their sites to drive traffic to your app. Uh, so yeah, this is a great strategy. This has worked. Um, I would say that you know these reviewer sites, they're not, you know, they're not anything huge for traffic. So I wouldn't count on it as the top three bullets, so to speak. But yeah, this this can definitely be a strategy. Um, and so you know you're probably going to go on the freemium model. Typically, when you when you have your app and you're setting it with your developer, you'll tell him, hey. You know, I want to make sure that I can turn on and off the ads. So this is important. Most most uh, app or uh, ad networks, you can do that. So you can just sign on, uh, and you can turn it off. So turn RevMob off, or turn Chartboost off um, if it's paid. And then once it goes free, once you release it to free, then you can go ahead and you can re um, you can make it you know show again. That's the nice thing about these apps. You can totally do that. You'll get a little spike because it'll be on some of these sites and, um, and that will help. But make sure that you don't use this as your sole um, bullet to fire on this. Um, that's important. You want to make sure that you have other ways of, of driving traffic. But, you know, why not do this, right? Why not have a paid one? Uh, $1.99 is working really well right now, $1.99. And you can try that out and then make it paid. And then maybe you do in that purchase a freemium model where you're actually pushing your your free traffic to uh, to your paid app. You know, so maybe you have a paid app or maybe you have in-app purchases inside of that app. Um, but, you know, make sure that you and here's another thing, actually, too. So we know launches are more important with apps now. Right. We know that when you launch an app, Apple weighs the algorithm a lot higher in the beginning than they did before. So, for example, before it was like, you know, and when I say before, a year ago, a couple years ago, you could release an app and uh, if it didn't work, you could constantly do updates. And if you hit an update in, say, three months, it would be somewhat easy to, to, get, to get it back up there. Now, because they give you such a chance in the beginning, it's important to really to, to, to launch this thing with everything set up, with all your marketing material set up knowing that it's not going to be perfect. But one strategy that I've seen work and that, that um, I like to use is basically whenever you launch an app and you have some insights, you see that, okay, you did a couple updates, you're only getting 20 downloads or 10 downloads or 15 downloads. One strategy that you could do is actually change the name of the app. So you take the app off the store, change the name of the app, and um, you know, it's the same, same everything, but you're changing maybe some of the graphics, or you're changing the name, you're changing some of the screenshots. Do minimal changing, and you can relaunch that, and then you can get another shot at that launch model. So that's important. Uh, a lot of people do this under different companies. So maybe they'll have two companies, and they'll just do you know the launch one, and then they'll take it and they'll split test some of their stuff under another company. But yeah, this is a strategy that you can do. You can launch an app multiple times. You just have to take it off and change the name and change the binary and change it so it's Apple looks at it as a completely brand new app. Um, that's that's a really good strategy. All right, I'm not getting downloads. What could I be doing wrong? Uh, I don't know exactly, but you know, I would say go back to the basics. If if you're not getting downloads on this, then there's something that that's missing. So it's either the the um, the trends, right? So these are the, the 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 product, the angle that you're going. So are there similar apps that are in the marketplace that you're emulating that you're taking to another level? That's what I'd ask myself. Or was this a independent, innovative idea that you created to see if it could get some traction? So that's the first thing. Go back to the basics. If there is a market for this app. Then at that point, we look at the marketing materials. So you'd say, okay, so I, I this app is great product. It's in the trend. The marketplace is still showing that there's a demand for it. Now it's about getting clear with 
and breaking down the fundamental parts of your marketing material. So that would be your title, right? Getting your title set, your keywords. So the keywords in your title are some of the, the strongest keywords. They weight them more. And then it would be going into your icon. You know, what does your icon look like? You know, what is your um, screenshots do? So single-handedly, I would go from changing your title and looking at your keywords to then changing your icon. And then, you know, last resort would be changing your screenshot. So basically, you should be getting some traffic on that. You should be getting some results. And then the last shift would be, how do I sell these people that are looking at my screenshots? How do I close them? And you really want to close them on that one screenshot. That's a big one. That first one you need to close them on. People are getting less and less. Um, they have less and less time. So you want to make sure that when they actually see your real estate, you're able to, to sell them on that. That's really important. What is your approach slash uh, methodology for selection keywords now that Apple is more strict about approvals? <laughs> this one, yeah, Apple frustrates me. Apple frustrates everybody on this one. Uh, it's like you love them and you hate them at the same time. So this is my strategy, uh, and, and it changes, right? I'm very aggressive with my keywords. I love to be really, really aggressive and push the boundaries. But you don't want to do this in the beginning, right? The first the first, uh, first time you want to get your app in the store. So you want to make sure that you are, you know, you're doing the right keywords. You're seeing, you, you know, all your mark materials are right. And, you know, maybe you are, if aggressiveness was one to five. And what I mean by aggressive, I mean keywords that are outside of your app. So for example, if I was doing a camera app, you know, maybe you're doing friends, you're doing sharing, you're doing filters, you're doing, you know, all those free or whatever, all those strong keywords, but you wouldn't do, you wouldn't go outside of the scope, you know, crazy. So you could do kids on that one. That's a good keyword on camera ones, but maybe you wouldn't do, this isn't a big keyword, but maybe you wouldn't do backpack, you know what I mean? Or, or maybe you wouldn't do game, something like that, that doesn't really relate, but maybe that's a strong keyword that would actually work for you. So I would say, you know, stick to a level one to two on one to five on aggressiveness, stay relative to the app, and then strategically up it a little bit through each update, you know, make them slap your hand basically. Um, and, and sometimes you'll hit one that really works. And the way that way to do this is to, to, you know, look at some of your competitive apps, look at the ones that they're using, you know, look at some trending apps, you know, maybe you can use some of the keywords that look like they're trending. Some of these apps that have some titles that look interesting that, you know, maybe they don't relate to your app, but you can try it and see if you can get it through. I just wouldn't waste that bullet in the beginning because, you know, once an app gets rejected, Apple looks at it a little bit closely and then their eyes are on you. And you want to make sure you get it in the store so you can start making, you know, your, your money back that you've invested. Does that make sense, guys? That's important. I want to make sure everyone gets it. Great. All right, moving on. App flipping. What would be the best kind of app, in your opinion, to flip that is not a gaming app? I like this question because a lot of people are moving towards games. Obviously, the App Store is evolving a lot towards games. But there's a lot of different apps out there and a lot of different niche areas that we can exploit and, and make a lot of money on um, and have a good time on. So um, the best kind of app, in my opinion, to flip there isn't really one. It's just, it's basically looking at uh, the mechanic, right? So a lot of these games is easy to skin because it's a similar mechanic. So it's either running or it is um, characters. It's a shooting game or it's a racing one and you can switch, switch out the characters. You know, Avalanche Mountain is a big one that people are skinning and that's a pretty easy one to keep switching out. Um, but when I say skinning other apps, I go back to, you know, utility apps. So your photo apps, um, you know, we're doing one that's coming out soon. And basically that one is, I'm doing two angles, but it's basically the same filter. So we're doing one that has all the different filters for the camera. And then I'm doing, I'm taking that same mechanic, but I'm putting the, um, the actual like HDR, like high resolution quick pick up front first. So basically one is, you know, hey, this one is amazing filters. It's going to make your pictures amazing. 
And the other one is a completely different angle, but basically the same app. And it is um, towards really high uh, definition pictures. So HD, HDR, high res, quick pics. So it's something that you can take a picture of quickly and use as a profile picture. And so it's, it's the same demographic, but it's a little bit different. And it's a different app that we can see if we can nail that, that trend, right? People want quick, easy um, HD apps very fast. So there's one there that you can do, you know, utility app. So there's a lot of Instagram and Facebook and, you know, like apps and stuff like that. So that one, the same, you can just take the same mechanic and maybe you name it something very different. You know, maybe you try different names, you try some different colors, you try some different screenshots. Um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of my, like Matt in our mastermind, some of our, some of our guys, they take, you know, ringtone apps or alert apps and they'll go ahead and they'll just skin those, you know, they'll do your favorite ringtone apps and they'll do, you know, ringtone and alerts for iOS seven, or they'll do, um, you know, um, fun character ringtone or, or whatever you see what I mean? But they have that mechanic of the actual alerts and, and ringtones. They just might change something small in the app or they'll change the title, change the marketing materials and they'll give it another shot to see if it actually works. So it doesn't have to be games. In fact, sometimes it's, it's easier not to do games, right? You can, you can easily see a response and you can see a demographic where games, I feel like games are kind of hit or miss in a lot of areas. But, um, you know, we do both. We do both. We do games and, and, and we do utilities and entertainment. So all of the above. How can I use App Empire system to help me out to build a net of app flipping? Does Chad use this system and which techniques to implement? So, yes, I do use a system. Um, we do a lot of app flipping, and especially with our program that we had with app flipping. Um, you know, basically with App Empire, what that will never change. Um, App Empire is kind of the fundamentals of understanding your business, understanding your your true reasons of why this works. So your market research, you know, your your monetization, understanding that you know this is how you emulate. This is how you're able to take something that works and make it even better and give yourself the best chance to succeed at the lowest cost possible, right? So that those strategies that we talked about in App Empire. We can apply them to different strategies, especially with the app flipping. So, for example, I would look at, you know, let's say a game that we're flipping and I would look at the fundamental reason and keywords that people are using. So I'll just use an example, say a racing game. We look at the racing game. And I'm like, OK, App Empire taught me that there's been a lot of racing games that have been successful in the last three months. Right. People love racing. So what are the main apps? And I'd go through them and pick out you know, the top 10 racing apps, I download them, I'd play with them. I'd see the marketing materials. How are people marketing to that demographic, right? I try to name that person. I try to say, okay, they are a 22 year old. Their name is, you know, Brad or Denise or whatever. And uh, they like playing this app, um, you know, on their free time and they love playing it and they love sharing it with their friends. And this is a person that loves racing apps in general. They have 10 different racing apps. So then when I start understanding that person and I start understanding those apps, then I start reverse engineering their success and I either buy the code of an app that I would I would make myself or I make that app and I just start flipping. it. I start you know coming up with 10 different racing apps in that genre because I know that's hot. You know, so I might do uh, I might do a uh, racing app that has a horse I might do a racing app that has a crazy you know, back to the future car. I might have a racing app that's a motorcycle or a bike or, you know what I mean? So you're just skinning that based on that, um, that demographic and that, that trend. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, racing is a trend, but it's also something that's kind of a pivotal that, that will always say that people love those games. That's the beginning of, um, you know, of gaming really is racing apps. So that's something that you can always jump on, but I just use that as, as an example. You can also look at other apps and other, um, you know, kind of places in the marketplace, categories that you can also um, break out. Is the best appreneur strategy more about flipping apps than emulating apps now? No, 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 no. So emulating comes first, right? Then you can then you can flip apps. 
So I would say emulating always comes first. You always want to see something that has shown that it has success, it's working, and you want to take it to the next level. You know, once you have that, maybe there are three to five new levels that you can do. And maybe instead of going three to five levels on that one app, maybe you take each different level and you carve our you carve out, excuse me, a marketplace and you use that as a skin. So maybe those three to five levels or three to five features or benefits that you have inside of your app, maybe you just use them as you look at it as like a house of apps and you try different bullets in those different features or benefits or areas. And you can you can split test your marketing. You can split test your um, like that specific feature, you know, so for instance, in the photo one, you know, I'm doing that, that quick, you know, kind of high def picture immediately. And then I'm doing the filters and then maybe the next one I would do, um, you know, certain frames or something like that. You know, you can, you can start to have, you know, your house, you can start figuring out, you know, different rooms in there and, and seeing which one you can hit first. And then once you hit one of those, you can decide, do you want to scale that one? You know, do you want to continue on that path? Or do you want to make similar benefits around that mechanic? Because once you have that demographic, whether it's emoji or a game or a um, picture app or whatever, at that point, they're, they're going to buy more things from you. And that's what I want you to believe. Like, okay, I have this customer. Now I just have to come up with either in-app purchase for them to see, or I can flip them another app. I can say, hey, you like this one? Check out this one. Um, so yeah, I want to make sure that you get that emulating will never ever change from the beginning of business and the beginning of time to the future. That's how businesses work, right? They solve a problem. You always want to solve a problem. And then you want to make sure that you're emulating on some business that has shown that the market likes and make that better. That'll always happen. All right. Everyone caught up? And again, if I'm speaking sort of fast, um, you know, this will be on the portal so you can go back and watch these and, uh, and take notes. But if you're just flying with your pen and taking notes, that's great because it'll sink right in. Even if you know these things, I think it's important to write them down because, you know, the, the, the more you do that, the better it gets, gets in there and, and the more it becomes unconscious. You just use it as part of your routine, which is that's what we're always looking for. All right. Mindset and obstacles. I'm struggling to get things started. Any advice? Um, so I'm assuming getting started with the app business. Um, yes, I would say if you're struggling to get started or you're struggling to take whatever you have to the next level, then it has to be some type of mindset thing, right? There's something that's going on that's blocking you. So I think the first thing to do is to be very clear with where you are. You know, so you can take out a piece of paper right now if you want and write this down. Where are you? Where are you in the game? So maybe it's you just set up an LLC and you have no idea how to publish an app. You know, maybe that's where you are. Maybe you bought the course or you've gone through the training, but you haven't set up a company or you haven't even signed to be a developer personally yet. So maybe you're stuck there. Where are you? And then where would you like to be? So now where would you like to be? So look at that. This is your vision. You know, you'd like to be, you'd have you know, five apps in the store and you're making $15,000 a month or $5,000 a month or, or whatever it may be. Maybe it's just a couple thousand dollars a month to start out with, right? So that's where you want to be. Now it's about closing that gap, okay? So this is where you can set up certain things uh, in that where that can help you succeed. Uh, and a lot of times it's that certainty. So entrepreneurs have to deal with an overwhelmingly amount of uncertainty. That's what makes an entrepreneur an entrepreneur. You know, that's what separates us from somebody that has, you know, a structure that's set up that they have to go ahead and, and go through and it gives them that comfort, that comfortableness. So look at what you think is actually blocking you, right? Be very specific. Maybe it's your environment. Um, maybe it's that, you know, there's, there's a negative voice in there that's saying you can't do this. Maybe it's the people that you're talking to don't believe in you or don't believe in the process, figure out really closely what is your stumbling block. If you had one or two stumbling blocks and you were coaching somebody else, this is important. A lot of times we 
can't look at our own plate, right? But it's easier for us to be the therapist on somebody else. <laughs> uh, I do this all the time. I try to like have my friends sometimes be me and I'll just coach them and I'll come to my solution where my own, my own brain throws me off sometimes, you know, so maybe play this and, and, and see what's actually holding you back. If it's one or two things, how can you switch it? Maybe it, maybe it's going to work uh, around an environment that is, you know, more conducive to your success. It's around positive people. Maybe it's going to meetups. Maybe it's getting a um, an accountability partner. You know, maybe you do some leverage stuff. You tie some some goals in there, and you put some really strong pain points. Where if you don't hit these goals, if you don't sign up for something, or you you don't um, you know get a certain level, then you have to do something painful. Whatever that may be, whatever you can think of. But this is. This, guys, is where exactly people stop. And this is what I want to make sure that you get across because you're going to have – everyone has these every week, every month, every day of their life, some type of stumbling block. And uh, you know, and, it, and it's our moment of setting this up where we actually break through that. You know, So it's important. I also want to make sure that you set yourself up for success easy in the beginning. Right? Momentum is, is one of the most underrated or stated things – that I've seen in this area, getting momentum and making it easy because once you're going down that hill, you know, it's a lot easier. Once you're, you know, in motion of walking up those steps, you can keep doing it. Once you set up your system, it becomes like second nature. So make sure that you set yourself up for success early and you, you start getting some momentum. So break out your easy steps that get you to your larger deadline or your larger goal. And so, you know, you'll realize that you just did three or four things and you're like, man, this is really easy. I can keep going. And before you know it, you've crushed your first goal and you're on to your second one or you've crushed your second one and you're on to your third. Uh, it's just that it's that discipline. And I think it's the strategy of looking at the big picture of where you are being realistic, where you want to be, and then setting up your routine and your strategy on actually getting through those stumbling blocks. I take this one very seriously. Does, it, does everyone get this one? And I think no matter where you are, even if you're on this training and you know, you're making $100,000 a month, which we have some students doing that right now, which is amazing, uh, this doesn't change for you. You, know, you have different levels. We have different levels of growth and different problems at different levels or different challenges at different levels. So this is one that I want to make sure that we, we nailed down. All right. Great. As a serial entrepreneur, I'm struggling with focusing and actually getting the apps out there. I have so many ideas and I'm such a visionary, but don't know how to get the work done. I need some real practical ways to change my mindset and get to work. So I feel like I just answered this one on the last one. Uh, this one is just about making sure you are being realistic, closing the gap and setting yourself up with a strategy. Um, I actually, uh, about a month ago, I, I've been doing a coach, having a coach for about three years, uh, but I actually took some, you know, some of my stumbling blocks and I, and I set it up with my coach and said, hey, this is what I want you to, to hold me accountable to, and this is how we're going to do it. So, you know, sometimes a coach, um, you know, you can do, and if you don't have any money, then, then maybe set up a coach or accountability partner, and you also hold them to accountability. So you can find somebody that you like to talk to. They have really good energy. That's important. And uh, maybe you set up a weekly call with them and you do a trade. You help them. They help you. You know, and a lot of times, and I get this all the time from teaching, you, you get better. You know, teaching, you get better on yourself. So it's a really fun thing to, to dive deep with somebody. And, you know, everybody needs this. It's a really fun thing to help people out and to have compassion and to be part of somebody succeeding. You know, making them a better person or making them a better entrepreneur or entrepreneur and being part of their ripple effect change. You know, there's nothing more gratifying than that. Uh, it's even more important than I think sometimes even our own success is just being part of success in general. And then you're, you're subscribing to that mindset and you're subscribing to that that energy that, um, you know, that, that, that matrix of the world where you're able to kind of create your own lifestyle. Right. That's what I believe in. That's what I've seen change. That's what we've seen change on many, many examples. So that's what I want you to subscribe to as well. 
All right, what's the biggest barrier to starting your own mobile app company? I would say the biggest barrier is is what we just talked about, which is setting up your uh, system, your routine. You know, making sure you go through step one to step ten, giving yourself some momentum, being very, very disciplined. A lot of times, our right brain will want to just be creative and work on drawing out an app. That's the easy part. That's the fun part. But if we don't set up other things like a good team or accountability or structured time, structured focus time, structured focus time, this one is important, then our design or our drawing or our fun little um, you know, exercise, our app that could, again, help people out or make you money will never get to fruition. Uh, so yeah, I would say making sure that you have everything set up so you can push yourself to, to success um, and you can get pulled into success as well. And a lot of times you'll set something up where it's, you know, it can be stressful to set some of these things up, but that's part of growing. You know, that's part of being the best you, but being part of this game is things will change. You'll have to change. You'll have to be resourceful. Resourcefulness is one of the big, biggest things to do, biggest things to have. Um, if a lot of you know Alex, I'm going to give Alex a shout out. She is absolutely incredible in so many ways, but being resourceful, she could do anything. You say, hey, Alex, I need you to do A, B, C, and D, and uh, it's something that no one could even do. And she's like, okay, got it. And it's having that type of determination within yourself and being around people that have that, it's, it makes you feel really good. And if you feel good, then a lot of times you're going to keep going. If you have pain in any of this, you know, a lot of times you, you can stop. So we have to look at our pain points. Um, you know, these are our barriers and figure out a way, the 80-20, that we can get through them. And a lot of times this is setting up a reason why we need to push through things and giving our reason why, you know, so focusing on our vision and that actual feeling in our bodies of, you know, being, uh, you know, the best husband or wife or parents for our kids, you know, the lifestyle that we're looking for, the reason why you actually took action to be part of App Empire or App Flipping, that reason, if you really sit there and meditate on that and feel that, that's probably the reason that will give you the offense to push through any of these things that can can stop you from moving forward. That's big. That's the mojo. That's the juice. That's the juice that pushes. That's the reason why we're even working, right? Without that, without having freedom or time or being able to take a breath or exhale or spend time with loved ones, whatever it is to you, there's no point in this. You know, we might as well just stop and 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 talk about something else. So that that I would say is probably the best and biggest thing that you can do to start, you know, when you start setting up a mobile company. All right, what to do if you think you are undercapitalized? Uh, so undercapitalized, it's it's a, I would say it's a few things. It's either one you can, you know, jump into a different model, right? So I don't know what undercapitalized is to you. If you're going after a $10,000 app or something like that, I would say, you know, try a different strategy, you know? So a couple of strategies could be, you know, look at the model that we have, look at the app flipping model and, and actually getting code and flipping your app. Or maybe it's going in on a partner. You know, maybe you have a friend, someone that you know that's been successful or that you like working with, and maybe you split it. You split the roles and you split the cost. And maybe they even help you as being a partner. You know, they're actually right there with you to push you and say, hey, we need to do this. I, I do that a lot of times. I, I structure a lot of different partnerships because I feel it holds me to a certain level. And I like working with people. And I never have all the skills and, and you know, and, and talent that it takes to get all the way through something like I, I want to play the best levels. And because of that, I want to be aligned with people that can call me out on my own shit, or they can sit there and be a cheerleader when we get to certain levels, you know, so you don't have to have a partner, but sometimes it's a good idea. Um, and sometimes it's a good idea just to have a, a teammate, you know, that's on your team that, that does that for you. So if you're undercapitalized, look at your strategy first, look at which apps you're going. And then if you need to, then you can, you know, get another partner or get maybe just a silent partner that's an investor. Um, there's also a lot of, you know, third party sites these days where you can jump in and do some crowdfunding. That also has worked with a lot of apps. Apps now are just, it's, it's mainstream, so it's common knowledge. And there's been a lot of investment on this sector. So you could jump on 
and do some crowdfunding and uh, and fund your app idea.